Hello, everyone. Isabel Ritz on Amazon Made Simple podcast. Today, I'm having amazing, amazing guest from amazing.com. And you guys already know who I'm talking about. Of course, it's Mike McClary. And I can talk a lot about his biography, how he's great. However, behind every single professional is the human being. He's a great father. He is great husband. He's having his wife that is always forgiving his for his flaws. And he's awesome. Two children and golden, golden doodle that is not showing up with us today on a podcast. And we're going to talk today about something that is always unrehearsed, Amazon related, e-commerce related. Genuinely speaking, we're here to provide you a lot of value. Mike, welcome. Awesome. Thanks so much, Isabel. I love that intro. I wish my golden doodle Penny was here, but she may make a surprise appearance at any point in time. You never know. You never know. That's like, uh, you never know what surprise is coming in your business. Same with your golden doodle. Isn't that true? You know, I mean, so I've been in this business now for over 10 years. And I think every time I think I've seen everything, something new pops up. You never really know what's going to happen. Yeah. And I, I've seen you for a while and um, a little bit the background. I've heard people, when I just started my Amazon, I've heard I was MS1, I was MS2. And I was like, what is MS? What is MS1? What is MS2? And the interesting part, when I was doing research, uh, how to launch a business on Amazon, which was in 2015, I was doing mostly research in Russian language because I had no idea how to speak English at all. So that's why I didn't find you guys. But I find out about you later. So the, the moment when I was already at some figures and some millions of mistakes. Anyway, anywho, uh, could you please tell me from your huge experience of your eight figure businesses coming back in 2013 when you launched your first right product on Amazon? My very first brand. And given that you guys are transitioning or transitioned recently to Shopify mode, if you will go back in time, and this is Sophie, she had to voice it. She's on the side of e-commerce too. So if we will be coming back in time, and now you have an option to launch Shopify, Amazon, or both, what choice would you do? I went back to 2013. I would still launch on Amazon first back then. Absolutely. Because launching in that day and probably back in 2015 for you too was so much different, um, so much easier. I'm not gonna say it was easy, but it was easier where if you were, if you knew a little bit about marketing and I didn't at the time I, I picked up, uh, but if you knew a little bit about marketing, you could very quickly have one of the best selling products on Amazon because most of the sellers at that time were bigger brands who just happened to throw their products up on Amazon because it was a, it was an additional channel for them. They were focusing on, you know, the Walmarts of the world, maybe the targets, maybe their own sites. So they didn't focus on Amazon. So when smaller sellers came in, knew how that were figuring out how Amazon worked, it was very easy to get sales. So I would still do that. I would still go there. I would still make, you know, my brand on Amazon probably maybe a few different products that I would. One thing I would focus on would be a subscription-based product, something that, you know, a consumable that people would come back and buy more of because I didn't really do that. I did launch one and then I gave it up for some reason. Don't ask me why. But I would still launch. The on one Amazon. that grew after in a huge brand from the different uh, competitor. I remember oh, you yeah. this example. I mean, at the my competitor store. only sold it for $600 million. Um, and so. Nothing. Yeah. Not worth my time, you know. Oh, yeah, absolutely not. <laughs> Mike, you mentioned about subscriptions. And there are different types of subscriptions. And you mentioned consumable. So if it will become consumable, which one would you direct yourself? Well, if it were back in the day, if it were back in 2013, I would go for supplements okay. uh, because those were definitely taking off. I think it was Dr. Oz around 2012 or something really was the first to talk about Garcinia Cambogia at the time. That was a weight loss supplement. And that's when, that was almost the genesis of this industry. People saw him talk about it, the effect it had on Amazon. And if you were selling Garcinia Cambogia on Amazon, when that happened, your sales quadrupled overnight. So 
I don't know if I go for that product because I don't really have faith in that product and I only want to sell things I have faith in, but I would go towards vitamins and supplements and build a, a brand because I think those I feel really good about. I take them myself. I know they do a lot of good things for people. So I would build, if I could, a world-class brand of supplements, vitamins, minerals, things like that. Um, and I think that that would be just a great brand to get into 10, 11 years ago. Okay. So here's two questions. What is the definition of branding and what is the definition uh, of brand for you? For a lot of people is just a logo and color scheme. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I really cared about a brand very much back 10 years ago. Um, we built one because you needed to have one still, but um, back then it was all about the product. And I think it's one of the things that's changed. I think back then having a really good product or even just an average product back then seemed to do really well. And you had a brand name, but it was just the name and the logo, right? Uh, I think today a brand is kind of, what is the quote? A brand is what people say about your business when you're not in the room. So your brand is what people feel about you and your products and what you offer to them that they may not tell to your face, but it's what they think about when you're not around. And so to me, that's how I think of a brand. When someone gets one of our products, a, a, a lantern or a flashlight or a headlamp, and they're not giving me a review when they're using it outside camping and whether they love it or hate it, what are they telling their family and friends about? That's kind of what my brand, uh, that's what I feel a brand is. What are the things people think and say about you when you're not around? Totally agree, 100% with you here. Hello everyone, Isabella Reads and Amazon Made Simple. I want to make sure you're getting the biggest value as possible from my podcast and from every single video I put out there. Please make sure to subscribe to my newsletter that I am posting the link below this video and you'll be always up to date with the product research, validation and development. It's completely free, promotion free, pure value forever and ever. Okay. So if I will get back in time when you've been launching your first Econ product and you will be building the brand and let's say we will workshop right now that we are building multivitamin brand for teenager, what would be your best approach to build the brand? Uh, there'd be a great question, by the way. You're, you're already going like right down the path that I would go. Um, I look for four things whenever we're starting any brand, whether it's uh, consumable subscription or or just a regular product as well. Uh, the first thing that I want to see is a big potential market. Um, and I want to know that there's hundreds of millions of people potentially who could buy this product. Doesn't mean they necessarily want to, but who could potentially do it. And the one reason we do that is because we use a lot of Facebook advertising and Facebook is so good at finding your audiences who will buy your products, but you have to give them a big group of people to go after. So if you can give them millions and millions of people to go after, they will very quickly within a matter of days or weeks find you a customer. Um, so that's why I want a big potential uh, market for it. Secondly, I also wanna make sure there's good demand because even though you may have a lot of people who could buy your product, it doesn't mean they're willing to spend money on that product. Um, for example, maybe bottle, bottled air. I don't know if that's a product or not, but I don't think a lot of people would buy product air. Do they need it? Uh, yeah, they do. Everyone needs air, uh, but not willing to like pay for it. Uh, so you need to make sure there's demand. Third. You have That's to make sure the funny you brought up air. Um, yeah. I was in Germany in, uh, I believe, 2010 or mm -hmm. 2011. And I was traveling with my children. I was thinking like, damn, these people are charging for everything. They're not charging just for the air. And my next step was, uh, stop was somewhere next to the Stuttgart. And the moment we went to the Airbnb, I had a bill where I had to pay two euro per person for the air. And I was like, <laughs> I just was making jokes that the only thing you guys are not charging us for here is the air. So and sometimes look at that. you just have to pay for the air. <laughs> it's not like you can stop breathing, but it just their rule. Keep going. Oh, that's too funny. But you're right. I mean, you need it. And so there's definitely an audience for it, a market for it, but most people don't have to pay for it. So you, you do need to have that. Um, yeah. And then I think the third thing would be profit because as much as, you know, we love doing what we do and I don't think you should sell anything you don't actually believe in and, and enjoy selling, you still need to make a profit. Otherwise you can't, you know, 
feed your family, uh, can't continue to grow their business, hire employees, give other people jobs and things like that. So you have to have to make a profit. So supplements checks that off the list too, because we all know that it can be highly profitable um, with the right kind of products and manufacturer. And then the fourth thing is you really need to differentiate it. You need something unique about your product in order to be able to stand out among all the others selling it out there. And so you already mentioned like, you know, supplements or multivitamins for teenagers. That's a great way to do it. In reality, a supplement for a teenager or a vitamin might not be very different at all from other ones. But if you can really narrow in on a specific niche or our demographic, that is absolutely a way that you can differentiate your product as well. Um, and the way I like to think of it, Isabella, is I always want to differentiate it in a way that I could show that in a Facebook ad. Because I may have something totally great and awesome and different than everyone else, but if I can't get someone to actually see it visually that it's different, it's not going to help me in marketing it. And so that's like the one key secret sauce to differentiation. Make Your sure teeth. you can show it visually. I told oh, you. She, she is that Sophie? Yeah, that's Sophie. She will show up because she's jealous. Hey, Hi, Sophie. Sophie. Hey, Sophie. Okay. That's it. I love you. I love you. We're going to continue. <laughs> It's almost every single podcast she is showing up. It's already like the attribute of the podcast. So you're absolutely right about the, uh, and I totally with you about the ingredients because they will be the same. It's like my favorite example is when you're going to the Walgreens and you need Tylenol. And the same Asiminitafen that is like in 25 plus boxes and packaging and you have headache, severe headache, uh, back pain, whatever pain, and it's the same as a fan. So Exactly. Right. So let's say we're launching for teenagers. We have this multivitamins uh, based on their age and metabolism and everything else. And the uh, laboratory is with us on the same page, letting us sell it with the right FD, blah, 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 approvals. So how, except Facebook ads, how would you market, how else would you market this product? In today's world, um, Facebook ads would be my number one paid channel. Um, that's okay. what I would use there because I think they'll find you customers. Uh, the second one would probably be free and it would be short form videos. TikTok, YouTube shorts, Instagram reels and Facebook reels. Those are those provide visibility to brand new companies, practically no money at all, if you can get one of them to really take off. And, and that's what I would do. So if I, especially if I was strapped for money, I would just focus on making two, three, four or five reels a day talking about the product and just making these short form videos go out there and talking about the benefits of my product and really narrowing in. Maybe depends on the age of the teenager. If I'm, if my products are for 13 and 14 year olds, my audience is probably the parents, right? They're the ones buying it for them. But if I'm talking about 18 and 19 year olds, my audience is, is more for them because they'll be watching um, these videos. And so, I don't know, maybe I need to figure that out. Maybe I need to make a video for the parents and a video for the uh, youngers and see exactly which one resonates. But that's what I would do. I would go out there and make short form videos to get as much free traffic as possible and make them good, entertaining, valuable, so that you can hopefully get people to start knowing, liking, and trusting your brand. That's great. And if we're talking about the platform, because the moment you mentioned Facebook, in my head, Facebook, you can sell on Facebook Marketplace. Facebook, you can sell on D2C website, which is uh, especially back in 2013. I think the main one was Wix and something else. I even don't remember if Shopify was around. Shopify was definitely around in 2015, 16. They weren't very popular back then in 2013 yeah. at all. Yeah. So what would be your main platform to uh, drive the traffic to? Yeah. So in 2013, it would probably be Google ads. So if you think back in 2013, we didn't have Amazon PPC ads. Um, PPC did not exist then. They didn't come out, that I think, until about a year later. And then it was dirt cheap and it was only auto. You just one button, turn it on. It ran ads for you. You didn't know what ads they were, but it ran them for you. Um, yeah. And so, but Google was very good for supplements back then. Um, and so I think Google in 2013 would be my primary traffic source. I also, if I'm going back in time, I would probably reach out to some of the 
blog sites that were out there that were doing SEO. There were some blog networks out there that were really starting to rank very well for whatever keyword or niche you're in. And I would reach out, I would do some research. I would Google, look for sites selling vitamins. We're talking about vitamins for teenagers. And then I would contact them directly and offer to give them a commission off of every sale that I made. Um, and then that way I would hopefully have them place me on their site as well. That'd be another good traffic source. So, and uh, again, I agree here. Uh, do you know Trevor Ziegler? Yeah, sure do. Yeah. yeah, he's a big fan of driving traffic through the blogs that you mentioned via Google Ads that you also mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, however, he's doing it these days more than he's running this traffic uh, using nonprofit grants. Wow, I did not realize that, no. Right, and I, them, I don't want to speculate. The grants, mm -hmm. some of them I believe up to definitely 10 grand or more. So uh, if to my understanding, if you're creating this brand and you can apply as a nonprofit, so you can run this traffic to the blog and sell it there as a nonprofit, blah, blah, blah. So it's like the whole story. This is what he's specializing in. Uh, and let's come to 2024. So this is what we'll be doing back in the days. And that's actually uh, that would be the easiest approach to sell and to scale to probably like eight, nine figures back in the days, which is not the case today because as you mentioned, we have to chase profits. We can't chase profits just on pure Facebook ads. So what would you do today with your brand if you will target parents and maybe so, friends of this yeah. name? You know, I would I would start off on Shopify today. So um, I, I don't want anyone to think that I am like downplaying Amazon. I still sell on Amazon. I still tell people to sell on Amazon. Um, uh, if I were launching a brand today, I would launch. I would I would launch very soon on Amazon. Maybe not day one. Maybe maybe who knows? But my the the what we've seen work right now is if you want to, if you're if the goal is to build a business that can drive profits and potentially become an asset. I believe you need to focus on Shopify because you then build a customer list that you have loyal fans that you can email, which you can't do on Amazon. You have some ways of reaching them via email using their customer engagement, but you don't own that email list on Amazon. Building your own Shopify-based business, you're building an asset that not only can you sell, but you can print money anytime you do an email blast. Um, and I mean, that's the beauty of, of building it on Shopify. Now, when I say build it on Shopify, I would do that by running Facebook ads, getting people to know our brand and going to our website to a, a landing page. It would have to be a very well-crafted landing page. So if I'm selling to parents of younger teenagers, my ads, my headlines in the ads, the images in my head, ads would all point towards a landing page that was very focused on parents of teenagers. And those parents were worried about their teenagers' health. And so it would all be very narrowly focused on them. And then I think that would have the best chances of converting. I would launch on Amazon almost immediately right after that. I wouldn't spend a lot of money on advertising though on Amazon PPC, because like you said, it can be very, you have to watch profits and going into supplements, starting out with Amazon PPC. In 2024. Tough. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, with such face like, until you have thousands of reviews, you would have a really hard time. But what I would do is run branded search campaigns on Amazon. Because what always happens, we've seen it past year and a half, two years, when you run ads on Facebook towards your Shopify store, there is a large number of people who will go look for you on Amazon just because they like buying on Amazon. They are prime members, they get free shipping. And by putting your product and doing brand advertising over there, they'll find you. You will get very affordable, cheap sales with PPC and those sales will convert. And so the beauty of that is that you start off converting at a really high conversion rate because you're only running brand traffic. That will help your Amazon sales take off as well. Now, you will they? Use, yeah. Uh, Chairman, quickly, uh, do you use any type of software that helps you to retarget uh, clients from Google to uh, Amazon to TikTok and all these platforms in between? And I currently do not, but it's probably because I'm being lazy. I know that there are some people out there using it. I think 
Pixel Me is one of them out there uh, that does something like that. I've also used, I can't, I've used a couple in the past as well, but I know Pixel Me is one that comes to my mind right now. We don't use that right now, and I probably should look into it. And the only reason is I, it's time. You know what I mean? Like, because I know you have to set all those things up to work correctly. And my thought is I'm trying to be as efficient as possible. And if I already know that if I run ads from Facebook to Shopify, and I know people are going to buy over there on Amazon by doing brands, uh, brand searches, I'm just going to run those and not worry about tracking it. I'm not, I mean, and trust me, there's a lot smarter people out there that love doing this and are probably getting better results because of that. Uh, I'm just being a little lazy right now. And again, I'm with you here because the moment, uh, I don't know, maybe it's the age part, but the moment you feel comfortable with something, I, for example, I like my profits on my products with PPC and I like my profits with Google and I'm satisfied. Can I improve it? Yes, I can. Do I want another hustle? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I would, well, you know, us 20 somethings like that, talking about our age, probably feel the same way about that, Isabella. Okay, sounds good. So uh, I was um, having some, I was uh, making some notes here. So when you've been also, uh, we have to unpack a couple of things. When you've been talking about reels and shorts regarding brand that you will post and you would post every day and you will be po posting daily, uh, we have several approaches here these days. You can do it yourself, you can hire a VA, or you can use it with the AI. Which approach approach is yours and which one is working the best? So a um, couple things. One, we haven't tried AI yet. Like I have not tried building either a virtual, virtual avatar to kind of present us out there. Um, so I haven't tried it yet. I want to try because I love AI. Uh, haven't really used a virtual assistant or just like outsource it to anyone either. Um, and I think it's because I feel, especially when you, early on, you as the brand owner need to be doing it because I think that you will care about these videos more than anyone else. And I think you need to, you need to show that to the, your potential customers out there. So I think starting out, I would do it myself as a brand owner. And at the same time, I would use the TikTok marketplace to find other creators as well who are already selling my products. And I think they're different. It's different than me paying someone just to, to create videos. This is what they do and they only get paid if they make a sale. So I think that's a really good place to go out there. And we've gotten some results. I'm not gonna lie and say I've gotten great results out of it, but we're getting good the results out of, of the marketplace. What results and great results for you? Oh, I mean, probably a couple sales every day or so uh, is good just from those creators. Okay. To me, that's good because um, we're not doing on TikTok shop a ton of volume right now. My assumption is that the sales from TikTok, the sales you get from those videos, mostly go to Amazon. I think most people still feel comfortable buying on Amazon. Yeah. Uh, and you could try to do a tracking link and tell them to like put this link in your profile. But again, I mean, that would work fine. You might want to do that. To me, I just want people to hear about our product and then go buy it wherever they feel the most comfortable. And I don't care necessarily about tracking where that happens. Totally with you here again, because TikTok shop was, uh, generally speaking, built for people to make it easier. It's just one click purchase. And yep. that's that's just where they're getting us like, okay, just double click. When, when they get there, it's going to be great. And they're investing billions of dollars yeah. into making that happen. And, uh, and you know, everyone's always wondered who's going to be the next Amazon, like who's going to actually dethrone Amazon and Amazon will be dethroned at some point. It has to happen. It always happens. Um, I don't know when that's going to happen, but I think if anyone has a chance of doing it, it is TikTok because really they came in from the whole creator standpoint, right? Like they have the Fair. traffic uh, and the audience. So we'll see if it happens. I don't know. Yeah. They've been building this audience forever and this audience has trusted audience and they have Genuine. And the algorithm is built the way how they will recommend you the videos. It doesn't matter how many followers you have right. uh, at these days in uh, TikTok. You're absolutely right here. So when you sell on TikTok and when you sell on Shopify, what fulfillment do you use? Um, so I'm using Amazon FBA still um, on for some of my products on Shopify. I use another company for 
called Falcon Fulfillment for some of my products. I spread it around, by the way. So I use Amazon FBA and Falcon as the company. They're a small company uh, up in La, in Salt Lake City that we've just known them for a while and actually own a small percentage. I'm not pushing them, but that's why we use them. I get a better deal. Yeah. So <laughs> that's why we use them for there. Um, but also we do some fulfillment here. I happen to have a son who just graduated from college and he's thinking about going to law school next year, which means right now he needs work and money. And so we do some of the fulfillment right here. It's not a huge volume of the fulfillment during a year. Almost all of it, I'd say 90% is all by Amazon FBA and the Falcon fulfillment. But those small other things like on TikTok shop, if I, I don't have those, it's a couple of day, right? So I don't have to have those sent anywhere. Uh, so we just fulfill them right here. It makes it simple. Which means you always have extra inventory somewhere in your worry house slash garage slash something else. It will send you a photo after this and we can kind of you'll see i have like products up on walls actually i actually put a video it's on my tiktok account if you want to check it out of like one of the racks of like lanterns and flashlights we always keep extras here that's very wise and that's great i have about 200 units of inventory that's been amazon returns of the absolutely amazing product which means i mean amazing is a definition that's brand new, never opened. Uh, but because it was Q4 and during Q4, you know, people have opportunity to return the product within 90 days. So we have a lot of them. And I am still hesitating to put it right now as a, to sell as a merchant because the main batch is not on Amazon. And I'm like, the moment I will put this 200 units on Amazon, it will be sold out in like a week. And then I will lose my ranking again. So I will wait. And, um, uh, Unfortunately, I'm not so great as you are, and we never have extra inventory somewhere here. We keep reordering from China, trying to be on time with restocking. And even it's like in Russia, we're saying, um, not we, they are saying, is like the cobbler without the shoes is... Americans probably have something similar to say when, like, you know how to sell on Amazon, but you keep logging with uh, your personal inventory when you understand, like, I need to restock and I'm still out of stock. Anyway, well, uh, don't, uh, we've run out of inventory multiple times over the past two years. So, and and I just keep this here for those other orders that come in. But we have the exact same issues that all started with COVID. Our shipments got delayed. Um, and then once that happens, it just kind of backs up. And unless you're willing to spend a couple hundred thousand dollars on inventory at once, um, it's not easy to ever get ahead of the game. And I believe this. I don't think anyone, I don't think anyone should, unless you're a big, big company and brand, I think you need to watch cash flow because you never know what could happen in this business. And the last thing I'd hate to have anyone have is a hundred thousand dollars worth of inventory that they can't sell. I would rather run out and be out for a month then have six months worth that is tying up all my cash reserves and I can't sell because something happened on Amazon. A lot of people are asking sometimes, should I increase the price when I'm running out of stock? What's your opinion about it? I don't know. Um, I, I don't want it to slow down. Um, and the way that we price our products, we always have a good profit in there. And so the thought is, you know, I mean, we, we, and don't get me wrong, in the past, there were times we've done that because it worked really well in the past when ranking was a lot easier. Um, but we just typically let it sell out. And then to me, and I am not an al, you know, Amazon algorithm expert. I know what works for us. I know it works for people I've seen, but yes, I don't. Mike McClary yeah. said he's not an expert. He's not, <laughs> nobody's an expert then at all. It's just, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know he, about that. Well, I, so <laughs> that's like a lot of like, you know, this Lambo gurus, they're like, <laughs> I know everything. So on Amazon for three days. And now I'm a such a guru that I'm Lambo guru. And like, Mike McClary, like, I'm not an expert, <laughs> but you know. <laughs> Well, Isabel, you know, you you know, there are some people who live and die for the algorithm, and they will go in there and try to understand every single trigger and lever you can pull. And I have huge respect for them. I mean, there are some people out there. Uh, Brandon Young's one of them. Awesome. He understands so much about the algorithm. Ritu um, understands the PP side of it. Destiny people. I mean, I could name all these people. They have tons of respect for who understand so many nuances about this business. I just don't think I have the capacity to dedicate that amount of time towards it. And I love the fact that they do because I can kind of like pay attention to them and 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 keep track of all these things that I hopefully 
soak up as I listen to them. But I just don't have the time to do all that. And so for me, I'll actually get back to my point here. Um, the whole issue of running out of inventory and trying to like, and not never wanting to lose rank. I don't worry about that. I just don't worry about it. I haven't seen it be an issue. Again, my brand may be more established. It might not be that much of an issue, but I think it's a normal thing of business. And if I run out, I'd rather run out at my normal price and then start selling at my normal price, maybe with a little more of a coupon or PPC when I'm back in stock. But we have not seen it hard to gain that rank back up. As long as you have a good quality product that's in demand and that converts well, it's never been a problem to get your rank back. 100%. We uh, also noticed that Amazon is letting you to sell the product that is out of stock, but on the way on Amazon. So if you put out there the tracking number, even if it's uh, the C tracking number, the tracking number of the, uh, oh my gosh, of your container, uh, Amazon lets you sell the product. So we are with like our brand and I think a couple of clients, we have this with a couple of clients, we have the same situation. Uh, we're still out of stock, but we already have like 200 or something uh, orders on the back. The moment the inventory will be in stock, the cash flow will be just coming because, because that the inventory is nice. will be shipped. Yeah. Are they using a, are using AGL, the Amazon Global Logistics for that, or just regular? No, no, we, okay. we're we using actually tactical. Okay. Yeah. Good. So we're using tactical and genuinely speaking, it doesn't matter who you use at this point, as long as it's trackable, Amazon will be happy to put you uh, on PPC and rotation and you will keep selling. I don't know <laughs> how, uh, and like to your point, like you don't know this algorithm uh, to the point where like you're just finding out that like, oh, inventory is being sold. And when I went to Amazon account, I'm like, oh my God, inventory is not in stock, how it's being sold. And I'm going on a listing or maybe something is wrong. No, it says temporarily out of stock. But you have this add to cart and buy now button. Awesome. The only thing I have seen is, and we will, we will pause our ad campaigns or at least most of them because we have seen the conversion rate drops because people will see that it arrives in two weeks. You know what I mean? And I think that's one of the things people shop on Amazon the most for is they want not just the prices and the free shipping, they want it to get it fast. And so we have seen decreases in the conversion rates when it says it won't be here for at least a week or so. And I agree with here too. Yeah. It's it's like chicken and egg. Yeah, so yeah. You I want can. the sales, but. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you have to find the approach that you'll be satisfied with yeah. Uh, but your person, but with the product you guys are selling. So everything we're talking here and all these tactics we're dropping in the podcast, it doesn't mean you have to do exactly like that. It means you have to test it. And every single marketing, uh, every single approach is about testing. Uh, not everybody can marry the same woman and not everybody can marry the same man. That's why we're trying to find the part, the second part that will fit us at least 90%. <laughs> I love that way of thinking about it. You're right. I mean, and that's and that's so true. People, I mean, how many times have people asked you, should I do X or Y? And very seldom is it X or Y. You know, you can say that usually this works, but not always. Things are different. Your product's different. Your brand's different. One thing you can't control, and this is one of the things that I always, um, when it comes to Amazon PPC, I sometimes like to consider it playing blackjack with idiots. And I'm not trying to cut anyone down. Um, I'll like to choose a different word other than idiots, but sometimes it is because the one thing you can't control when you're doing PPC is what the person next to you is bidding. So someone may be willing to bid $20 for a click for their $10 product. And if that's happening, even if they have a bad converting product, if they're willing to do that, it'll be very, very hard for you to outbid them. Even if your product converts better and Amazon knows it's going to convert better, they're going to get some of those clicks and it's going to push your cost up. And so there's no such thing as I've had people come to me like, hey, I want to I want to rank for pickleball racket. One of the toughest, you know, keywords out there. Clicks are going for 12 to 15 dollars. They want to rank for pickleball racket, but they don't want to spend 12 to 15 dollars and asking how to do it. You can't like there's no there's no way to do that because all the other people that are out there selling pickleball rackets that got into the game two years ago have inventory and now they need to get rid of it. Everyone's bidding uh, a lot for those. So you can never control the people around you is the one thing that neither you nor I can ever 
control either as well. Like what are the people in your niche, your category going to do that's going to affect you as a seller? Yeah. Also with the pickleballs, we have one client that we launched yeah. and we launched not bad because we found in the pickleball ball niche, there is some specific keywords. Don't, Shh, tell, don't tell anybody. No, yeah. I, I'm sharing with you, not with everybody. So there are <laughs> some specific keywords that are kind of like, in the niche under niche, but those keywords are having 4,000 uh, search volume per month, and they can give you up to 30% of the search volume and sales. So wow. if you build this pickleball set on the way how your customer avatar is searching for, and especially if you'll make this pickleball set uh, and it will be USAP approved, USAP approved, it maybe, you know, it's... Um, uh, uh, United States Association of Pickleballs. I forgot how it's like this abbreviation works. Uh, our client paid a lot of money to have this approved stamp, but now it's the sub sub niche with the sub approved, and now the sales are much better than they could be, and the bid is not that expensive as it should be. So you can always find those little yeah. nuggets in there. Yeah, so when like uh, I am against the niches like pickleball completely, mm -hmm. like I would never recommend anybody to go there unless you have a pretty good amount of money and you have a great budget. Uh, however, if you decided that you are going to sell cutting boards, bamboo cutting boards, or product like pickleball or something like that, that is that is super saturated, make sure you will find some specific need that it will help you to convert. That's to the point that you're- Great advice, that really is. Yeah. I think, I will, you know- I hope people will follow at least some of them. Yeah. But they still don't. <laughs> they still don't. I mean, but, but the, others, the other thing you said is true. If you have a lot of money, I mean, money goes a long way because if you lower your price down to break even and you're willing to spend- $50,000 on that inventory and PPC losing money, you have a chance. But I don't know about you. I don't want to go spend $50,000 on something that I don't even know is going to work. Um, who does? I want to spend $5,000 on that. <laughs> like, like I, 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 I always, like one of the things that I always want people to do is manage your risk. It doesn't matter who you are, what kind of like brands you have out there. Always have what I call controlled risk. Know what you're getting into. Don't spend any more than you than you can afford to. And almost like going to Vegas, assume it's not going to work. Like if I knew someone's coming in, they wanted to start this business and they had five thousand dollars to their name, I don't think this is the right thing for them. Um, they should, you know, build up a little more money so that you can do this. Um, but don't assume this is going to work because it's business. You know, most businesses probably aren't going to be successful. I love it. Uh, Mike, you have amount of uh, students in the past, like some politicians don't have so many fans as you have people you taught how to do business on Amazon and e-commerce in general, which is, I believe, 37,000. So what is the biggest challenge you've seen when those people launch their products and what was happening to them in a year? So, well, it's hard to pick out the top line. Can I pick maybe two? Is that okay? You can pick okay. up three. You can pick right. up five. You can do whatever you want, Mike. <laughs> I think the biggest challenge starting out is understanding differentiation, understanding really how to make your product stand out. Um, and I've been guilty of this throughout my you know time selling as well, because... It, it changes over time. You think, you know, maybe a red pickleball paddle is better than a blue one. And if I went selling blue, I'll sell a red one. That'll stand out. That's not really differentiation. Differentiation is how can you really make your product stand out so it truly is better and provides more value than someone else? And it doesn't have to be a physical change to the product. Like you and I talked about earlier, you can really narrow into a specific category or demographic and offer them tons of value with that. So it really may be the same product, but you're giving them all types of information on top of that as well. But differentiation, I think, is the first thing people have a very hard time understanding because it's not easy. It, that's like the secret sauce, right? Being able to figure out how to make your product stand out is the secret sauce of this business. Uh, so that is by far the first thing. The second 
is understanding a good landing page. So I'm gonna, let's talk about either an Amazon product page or talk about like a landing page you build or your product page or landing page on Shopify. We all think that we're good at it, or maybe we don't, um, but I think that is the biggest struggle we've had. Like most people who, who struggle, they picked a product that has no differentiation. That's the first issue. Um, and the second one is their landing page or the product page just looks really poor or doesn't look any better than anyone else. It looks the same. In most situations, it's just not good. Um, you need to have great images, a catchy title with benefits in it. You need to really highlight the benefits in your bullet points, and you need to have good copy and imagery below that, whether it's on your Shopify landing page or your A plus content, all those things, all those boxes you have to check off benefits, images, title with benefits, more imagery below all those things have to be done really well in order of the best chances for success. And even doing those doesn't guarantee you success, but if you don't do those, I can pretty much guarantee you won't be successful. So you made the major touch points here and when people are building their listings slash landing pages, what's supposed to be the first to think, or maybe three, whatever you want, as many as you want to put out there, uh, in the first three seconds, what they're supposed to see uh, regarding about this product? It's gotta be why that product's gonna solve their problem. It's the picture, right? But for me, it, the very first thing is the image and they have to immediately understand why that product that they see the picture of is going to solve whatever problem they have or give them whatever benefit they're looking for. If you can't do that in your image, you're going to struggle. It doesn't mean you can't be successful. I'm not trying to say that, oh, you're going to fail. That's not it. It just, you'll struggle. Like it makes it so much easier. If your picture conveys immediately the solution to their problem, that will get their attention and get the click. And once you get the click, then you have to convince them why this is going to do that through your copy whether it be your bullet points, your other videos, or anything you have below the fold? Uh, a lot of people, they are, at least from what I noticed, they are mixing up the features of the product and the problem solving of the product. What would be your recommendation, I'll not say advice, it's super overrated, but what would be your recommendation to be able to Say the difference in between the feature of the product and the benefit of the product. Um, this is always a hard one, right? I think after you've lived it for so many years, you get it. And sometimes I even fail. Like, you know, Matt Clark still corrects me so many times when I, I do my copy. And the first thing he'll say is, what's the benefit that this is providing? Because if I don't have that as the very first thing on the product, that's, that's a sign that, you know, we're not going to do very well. Uh, and so to me, the benefit is the problem you're solving. The feature is something specific about the product that may solve that problem, but the benefit is really what is the problem you're solving? So for example, let's take a lantern. Um, the benefit would be illuminate your entire campsite for 24 hours straight without changing a battery. That's like a benefit, right? Now, a feature would be um, provides continuous light for up to 24 hours with fully charged batteries. That's a feature. It doesn't really talk about the benefit of it. But if you talk about putting them in a scenario where your product is going to give them that benefit or solve that problem, that is how I think of it. What's the scenario that you're solving a problem or actually providing a huge benefit for them? Awesome. When we are using the selling copy by providing benefit, what type of picture was, was supposed to supplement to this copy? Yeah. So, I mean, there's a, I guess a standing kind of rule, not rule, but a, a process, a lot of people sell that your pictures should follow the bullet points. That's one way to do it. If you want to come up with a really easy way to, to do this without thinking through it, if you have five bullet points and each one of those five is a benefit, have five images that match up with that benefit. So if I could see my first one was illuminating the entire campsite. Well, one of my images should be illuminating an entire campsite. Um, I think that like your images should supplement all the benefits, uh, that that's one of the things that I, I believe very strongly. You need to have that. I also think that your images need to, um, compare yourself or talk about why you stand out from the competition. Like, why is this product the better of all the choices out there? You don't have to call out your competition, 
but you certainly should be able to say why your product is better than the competition. And again, a picture says, you know, it says a thousand words. So if you can show in a picture why yours is better, you know, an infographic is a great example. Have your product and then you have the chart, us, them, like, you know, ours has all these different benefits to it. Theirs doesn't have any of them. I think that's a graphic every product should have out there. 100%. I like feel that I don't have anything to add because you said everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just had a couple more questions and I was so entertained by listening to Mike that I lost them. Oh, thank even you. I was in, <laughs> when I was writing things down. Okay, this one. So when we are building Amazon listing uh, and when we're building Shopify website, uh, by the way, I'm not selling Shopify. I have Shopify website, but I'm super lazy, as you said. Uh, so I uh, I have a Shopify, but I generally speaking, don't have the Shopify. Anyway, so is there any difference in between graphics for Shopify and graphics for Amazon, because generally speaking, you have there, I don't remember, what well, is there any limit for Shopify pictures or not, but you have pretty much the same listing. You have pictures, price, conditions to purchase, and add to cart, and upsells. Number is going to vary based on your theme, but they're all, let's assume they're the same number of pictures. So really, the only picture that's different is your primary one. We're limited on Amazon. They have the rules over there um, that you have to have, you know, your image, your product on a white background. You can use some other things on there if they go along with the product. Like I think, I believe like a ring or a watch, you can show it on a hand if you want to. But in general, let's assume that like you can only show your product on a white background. On Shopify, you do not have that at all. Your main image can be anything you want as long. I mean, there's no as long as. It can be anything you want. The only thing to keep in mind, there's like two parts to this. Uh, the main thing to keep in mind is if you're going to be running Google shopping ads, they have the same guidelines as Amazon pretty much. It has to just be your product. So if you're going to use that for a Google shopping ad, then you will want that primary image to be on a white background. The second part to this that is different is that we recommend most people should not send traffic to their Shopify store product page. You send it to a landing page where um, it's a page that is designed just to sell your product through a story to a very specific type of customer. So in Shopify, you have product pages that are all pretty standard. Your theme will control how they look, but they all have the same things, the product title, the images, the price, and then the buy box button or the buy button right there. You have some control over those, but not a lot. And for what we've seen, most product pages on Amazon don't convert very well. Most. Some companies out there are going to do great with that. Like there's always the exception, right? But most don't do well. And I think the biggest failing I've seen is that people send traffic to those product pages instead of a landing page because a landing page doesn't even have to have any kind of background on that first image. Your image can be an entire image of your product being used by a family or, or whatever it is. It can be a person exercising with your resistance bands, you know, in a, in a gym. A landing page is just a website page that is entirely driven to sell your product and its benefits doesn't have any of the characteristics of a product page. You control everything on it. If you focus on sending traffic to a landing page on Shopify, you have such a better time at getting conversions over there instead of just trying to send it to a product page. Do you have an opportunity to put on a first image, the video of your influencer recommending your product instead of- On a landing page, yes. Yeah, okay. on, on a landing page. I mean, I believe you might, well, with standard Shopify, I don't think they let you put a video as the primary image. They have some of the same guidelines for their product pages. On a landing page, 100%. You could have an influencer using your product on there. You control every single aspect about your landing page. And I think one of the, the best, not a feature, but one of the things that we do on every one of those is have give them the option to buy more than one unit. Like at the bottom, when they go down, have them buy two, three, or five. Um, you know, people often think, well, I don't have any complimentary products to go along with our products. Like you have to have something to goes along with it. You don't sell them multiple quantities because if you give them a good enough deal, a lot of people will, will buy multiple quantities. I was going to, uh, I have a big flashlight. It's like a foot long flashlight that sells for normally like a hundred bucks. 
we usually discount it. Um, but when Matt and I were working, he was helping me with my Shopify store. He was building out a landing page with me and he wanted to bundle, what was it? It was three, five, and six units together. And I was thinking, no one's going to buy six of these flashlights. Who needs six flashlights? And he was kind of chuckling, you know, like, hey, you may be right, Mike. I'd love to see you prove me wrong. I did not prove him wrong. We had people that were coming in and buying five or six flashlights. I mean, granted, it wasn't a ton. And that's were those saying. B2B clients? These were just regular customers. They were not B2B. They were customers who they got a big enough discount. We were offering up to 50, 60%. We're giving them 6% when they bought five flashlights. To me, I still made a profit because we were shipping those all in one box. So I'm not paying a separate fulfillment fee from Amazon, right? Like for right. Amazon, you're going to pay a fulfillment fee for one of those. We were shipping them all in one box. My shipping was a little more expensive, but since shipping is such a big part of like your, your cogs, your cost, we were still profitable selling these five flashlights to people. And I was, I was surprised by how many people will buy bundles of the exact same product. So if you don't have any more than you don't have any, if you only have one product, you don't have anything to add to it, sell people more of that product and you will be surprised how many actually do. Yeah. And that works, especially some of the products where the one that you can sell as B2C and B2B, when mm -hmm. you put out there the business price and the quantity discount for business price and for the like normal people that are buying, like just Amazon Prime, that's increasing uh, sales sometimes a lot. Like uh, I'm seeing once in a while we're having business clients, business customers are purchasing like seven, 10 units. I'm like, oh, that's great. And uh, like when I started noticing that a cost for one of the campaigns is like 1%, I'm like, interesting, how did it happen? And that happened because it just one buyer purchased like <laughs> one tenth of the inventory per, per day. So- Don't you yeah. love those screenshots of that a cost? when you get like one click and someone spends $200 sometimes on an order, sometimes you I feel do. like a genius. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes I do. I'm like, look what we did. But genuinely speaking, when you're like going on a roll and this, every single mm -hmm. day, you're really forgetting to do all this. Screen I stuff. have a question for you as well. Then yeah. you, you brought something up business clients. Um, are you, have you tried out? We have not, but have you tried out selling case pack products yet where you can actually list your product, like in a case of 10 or 12? Uh, no, we did. 10 or six and eight, I believe. We didn't do 10, 12, okay. we did six and eight uh, because for our client, for our business clients, we thought that it will be the fair number and it mm -hmm. worked. But okay. we sold, I believe, one set of 12, mm -hmm. but it's just been 12, 12 units they purchased. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to try that out. We're considering doing that because our a lot of our it lanterns come in cases of eight. It, yeah, does, it doesn't cost you it anything. Back. It doesn't cost you anything, especially when you do the virtual bundle as the variation on I your listing. I love it. I'll have to try that out. Yeah, you can do it right now while we speak. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's a lot of things that we unpacked today, guys. Uh, we spoke about Golden Doodle and Mike and Amazing.com and uh, 37,000 people that learned from Mike and made their millions and billions. And Mike, who made billions, no, did you? No, I don't think I'm, I'm not quite there yet, no. <laughs> yeah, well, definitely eight figures from his brands. And we spoke about brand and about conversion rate and about PPC and the action about on PPC and uh, shipment and logistics. Generally speaking, that was kind of sprint course into the e-commerce and also we spoke about conversion rate on uh, in between Shopify and uh, Amazon. So there is a lot of takeaways for lots of you out there. And it's not like we're putting out there any promotions or something and you know, you, everybody knows that I'm against promoting something, but check out SellerCon if it will be coming out. And by the way, is there SellerCon happening? We don't know yet. So I'm um, to be to be 100% we're we're open about this. February, Mike. I know. We we would love to have it again. Celicon was amazing last year. It was great having you guys there, by the way. It's awesome having you out there. Um, I love seeing like our some of our sponsors out there, how much you guys added just by engaging with all the members there. Like we had people going out there and talking, and there were funny videos being created. But Celicon was awesome. We have not decided if this year we're gonna do it. We may have to wait a year. And the only reason is. 
it takes like half a year to plan and promote. And if we do that again this year, then that would be the only thing we're promoting. We wouldn't be doing anything else. Uh, and it's just a ton of work. So I would guess, I can't guarantee it. I would guess we'll do it in 2025, sometime in the spring of 2025. I feel you because right now, and for those of you that are listening, the event has already passed. We're putting together just the party in Las Vegas, and it's taking a lot of time. And this party is just like for 300 people. It's not 2,000 people out there at the event. Uh, anyway, check out amazing.com if you didn't. And uh, follow Mike. He's putting out there TikTok every single day. I follow, I know, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if SellerCon will be happening in 2025, please make sure to join. It's amazing event. They always put in out there people on the stage that are dancing, entertaining, the speakers, they line up. Uh, they're in, like A to Z event is just experience. It's not just about learning. It's an experience when you're entering the floor and you can't leave the floor till the very last person because you feel that you will miss out on something. So you will get the form if you will not go out there. And by the way, I forgot to tell you, the SellerCon 2019, and it's the last thing that I'm uh, telling here on the podcast, uh, SellerCon 2019, that was my first event that I was visiting in the United States in English. So, and when I went there, that was for me such a um, kind of the first step into the industry when I've seen all of you guys out there. And for me, it was so unapproachable to talk to Mike, to talk to Matt, to say hi to Ted, Kevin King. And uh, I didn't know English well. I was literally during the seller con taking notes and using Google Translator to understand what people are talking out there from the stage. So, and after that, I started going from event to event till uh, the bug started. But thank you so much for making this event happen. They are amazing. They're awesome. And they are something that a lot of people need because having this inspiration for everybody, for people that are already doing business, for people that sold their businesses and want to launch again, for people that never launched businesses. I've seen people crying at SellerCon, really. One lady came up to us and she was crying how she's inspired and she wants to do all this stuff. So you guys are doing a great job. I'm very honored to talk to you today and to know you. I, I love hearing that. I mean, they are incredible events, not because of, you know, of us putting them on. I I get the same things out of those events as well. They're they're all packed with value. We have amazing people there. And like you said, it's it's the people you meet there, the experience, the networking, the people you meet um, that, I mean, I've made lifelong friends from events like that and others as well. And so they're just great. And I wish I was free to come to yours out there. Is that going to be at the, is that at the Prosper event you're going to be it at is, or the MDS it event? Is, uh, free Prosper. It's March 3rd, Skyloft. Okay. Uh, sweets, uh, penthouse, Rich Galstein and I are putting together. We will end up with sponsors and we have a lot of registrations and you're more than welcome. You'll be our VIP guest there. Ha. I wish I could. I will be in Florida next week, relaxing for a much needed week off. Where? Uh, it is going to be in, uh, hold on, hold on. It's the, what's the name of the place? It's it, that big hurricane hit there. My gosh. Um, oh, they had the, it's right by Naples, just a little bit north of there. Oh, Fort, Myers. oh Fort Myers. Fort, yeah, Fort Myers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one of my best friends lives down there. And so I'm going to spend a week down there. We're going to do no work at all. Hang out, watch some spring training baseball games, play a little golf, um, and just totally relax for a week. Make sure you take a boat, go to the Key West and back. It's a great experience. I, that'd be great. Yeah, you can take one day trip. Mike, thank you so much for being here today. Again, great to talk to you. A lot of knowledge, a lot of expertise. And you're just so much fun, always. Oh, thank you, Isabel. I loved it. Awesome podcast. Thank you so much for everything you do for uh, all your people that follow you too. Yeah, talk to you soon. All right, bye now.